Well, thank you for joining us for the Bioprocess Next Summit today. We've created this forum for you, biologics developers and manufacturers, those of you that are shaping the future of biologics. There's no denying it, these therapies are changing the world and transforming lives by providing better treatments. The future of biologics and its growing potential to benefit patients with unmet medical needs has perhaps never been more promising. And the market reflects that. It is anticipated that 70% of new drug approvals are expected to be biologic by the end of the decade. We are where we are today because individuals and companies like yours have worked on some of the world's biggest challenges. Those advances and discoveries have led us to where we are, moving into a world of emerging therapies. We are starting to tackle orphan diseases. We're getting better at reducing symptoms and side effects by being more targeted with the molecules that we're developing. And we have one common theme that drives us why we all do what we do, and that is to find a better way to make the world healthier. With that in mind, I'm honored to introduce our next speaker. Brendan Connors is a melanoma veteran and survivor. His story inspires me not only due to the impact and availability of better therapies, but also because timing was such a critical factor in his story. As an introduction to Brendan, we have permission to share a short video that Brendan produced in partnership with the Stand Up to Cancer initiative. I always had the travel bug, but not like this. It was one of those things where you just realize how short life can be, and there was a lot of places that we wanted to see, and realizing, why am I waiting to do it? Why don't we just do it as soon as possible? I'm Brennan Connors, um, I'm 35, and I am a metastatic melanoma cancer survivor. Back in 2010, I scratched a mole on my back, and my younger brother was like, you know your back's bleeding? So I went to a dermatologist, they did a pre-biopsy and saw that it was precancerous, and they found out that there was a mass underneath my shoulder. That's where the cancer had actually spread to. Some way it went from the left side of my shoulder, um, an area, and then it made it into uh, my right bone of my leg. And it was one of those things where it was kind of like surreal, where like, by the way, you had stage four metastatic melanoma. I was able to then enter into this clinical trial. I was going through an immunotherapy process, and what immunotherapy essentially is, it's taking the cells in your body and it's actually teaching them that cancer is bad. So your own cells are then fighting the cancer cells. They were monitoring to see how the cancer was continuing to shrink. My last actual treatment was about five years ago, and I've been uh, cancer-free since then. So towards the end of the treatment was when I was um, turning 30 and I wanted to put something together that was going to make everything you know, worthwhile. I wanted to make a list of things that I could do and should do and I thought 30 things in the year 30 would be a great way to kind of do that. My goal was to finish all 30 things by the time my 31st birthday happened. For 30 and 30, we decided to go to the Havasupai Falls, which is in the west rim of the Grand Canyon. It's a solid 11 mile hike. And then you come upon this beautiful waterfall. This is actually the first time where I told uh, my girlfriend at the time, my now wife, that I loved her. We were in Italy. We ended up going up to Lake Garda. I decided that the best part would be to surprise her and get engaged in a castle overlooking the water with mountains in the background. And she had no idea that it was coming, and it was absolutely beautiful. We were at Rainbow Mountain. Part of the two-day hike was actually camping overnight at 14,000 feet. Just sleeping was tough because the air was just so thin. We got to the peak of it and it was 16,300 feet, which is essentially taking three Empire State Buildings and putting them on top of each other. You don't really know the limits of kind of where your body can actually take you until you actually push it. Um, and you don't have a choice for pushing it when you're going through different kinds of therapies. You just have to trust that, you know, your body's strong enough and that it will do it. Being able to struggle through actually breathing as you walk to the top of the mountain is just one of those realizations that all these trips that we're going on, you want to step back and think about the reason why we're doing all of this and how it has like a larger meaning. While I was posting some of these, a lot of people didn't know that I was actually going through outpatient treatment. While the photos on social media look, you know, great, there is obviously always that story that goes on behind. 
My advice to someone that's currently battling cancer is just keep your head up knowing how far you've come already and just staying positive. So what an inspiring video. Brendan, I'm really pleased to welcome you. Thank you for joining us today. There's a lot to learn from your journey. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your life before your cancer journey began? Sure, sure. First off, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, my name is Brendan Connors. I'm now 39 years old. I was born in New York City. I grew up in Long Island, New York and New Jersey. Went to college in Pennsylvania at the University of Scranton. I swam competitively in high school and in college. My favorite stroke was the butterfly and the individual medley. Um, lived in New York City for about 14 years. We're currently working in digital advertising. I uh, got married in 2016, recently moved to Connecticut. Um, my wife and I have traveled to over 40 countries since being married. Um, and I have a beautiful and amazing uh, little 21 month old daughter right now. That's great. Uh, Brendan, how did you first learn that you had cancer? What was the, the process of diagnosis and treatment for you? So I first learned um, that I had that something was wrong. I was living in New York City with my younger brother and I had scratched a mole on my back and he was like, that's really ugly. Like you should get that checked out. So made an appointment for a dermatologist and turned out that um, it was precancerous. So from the time that I had that first checked out to my first actual uh, cancer diagnosis was about six months of um, that full process. So in terms of kind of what that timeline looks like, uh, so May of 2010, like I mentioned, that was the precancerous mole. Um, first surgery was in, was in June at Mount Sinai, uh, where they actually dug out all around the actual mole um, and did a bunch of tests. I also had a uh, lymph node dissection uh, because they weren't sure since the mole was in the middle of my back, which, which area it was in. So they did it on both the right and the left side. Um, and then in November, I got the call that I was um, a metastatic melanoma cancer patient. Um, from there, everything kind of just took off. Um, we went through the process of trying to figure out where to go. Um, so had appointments at Mount Sinai in New York City, had appointments at Yale, ended up luckily uh, being placed into a trial down at um, NIH and NCI. So that started in January. Um, and as you can see from the timeline, I was down there for about a month and was discharged when it's going back and forth to NIH and NCI for um, a few months. And then in July, again, they saw that the cancerous area within my left shoulder had actually started to increase a little bit. Um, the area within my right leg was totally um, gone. So the focus was just solely on the left side. So from there, I ended up going into a second treatment at Sloan Kettering. I uh, was on that all outpatient for about a year. And then from there, um, continued doing, doing scans through the last final year. And then as of September of 2012, that was my last outpatient therapy. So in terms of kind of the overall clinical trials, like I mentioned, I was within two of them. Uh, the first one was at NIH and NCI. The second one was at Memorial Sloan Kettering. The first one uh, was a combination of a week long of chemo um, for about seven days. And then from there, it was interleukin-2, uh, which I did about six rounds, which is one round every eight hours. So I lasted about two days doing that. And then the second one was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which was all outpatient, which was a combination drug treatment of ipilimumab and nivolumab, which was 12 rounds total for about 12 months. Um, and once again, that was all um, outpatient. So I, I would like to explore a little bit more about the clinical trials you were involved with. And, and the timing and availability of these trials was so important in your case. If we move to the next slide, we'll see, you know, based on data from the Journal of Clinical Oncology, prior to 2010, almost all patients died from advanced melanoma. So how were the trials and therapies that you participated in different from what was available previously to melanoma patients? 
Yeah, I mean, thinking back to when I started my trial to where we are today is really breathtaking. Uh, my dermatologist would remind me, every, he still does remind me every time I see him that I'm lucky to be alive. Um, and the doctors would tell me that, you know, this treatment is new or we don't have a lot of information or a lot of data on what we're going to be going through at this point. You're one of the first to ever do this treatment or you're the first on this combination of treatments. So it was really, you know, the beginning of full on um, treatments. Um, and I remember my brother, so he's also a doctor as well. He was at a conference and he sent me a text message. And it was a picture of, um, of a chart similar, I guess, to this chart. And he circled the end of it. He said, this is essentially you. That's who they're talking about of, you know, the, the, the tail end of this where they're still learning from what you have gone through. And that was, it was kind of, you know, crazy to think about that I was trailblazing in a way. And then I didn't even realize I was, I was, I was doing that. Um, but this chart, you know, is just one of those really amazing things to look at, seeing kind of where it was and then where we are now. So in terms of kind of immunotherapy uh, and T cells, you heard me mention a little bit in the video, but I had to start figuring out a way to explain it to people that weren't within the immunotherapy area, friends, cousins. Um, so I was able to go into the labs um, at NIH and, and NCI and really kind of explore what was going on. So the way that I started explaining this to people was that, you know, first you need to have good cells that understand that, you know, they are the good cells versus the cancer cells, which are the bad cells. And then you need to extract those cells from the body um, and harvest them within a lab and actually teach them that cancer is bad. So my cells were being taught that cancer was bad within the labs of NIH and NCI. And they started to then grow those cells once the doctor saw that they understood that the cancer was bad. So when I say that they, 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 they grew them, it was 50 plus billion fighter cells, so to speak, that was then um, moved from the petri dishes within NIH and then moved back inside of me to then continue to fight those cancer cells. And then my body was then used as a incubator to continually grow those cells and continue those cells to continue to fight um, off all of the bad cancer cells, which is essentially how I'm describing immunotherapy. So these pictures here is kind of what I was just talking about. The one on the, the left is myself actually getting an opportunity to go into the labs and see what they were doing with my cells and how they were quote unquote training my cells to be cancer fighters. The second one is me holding that entire second row is actually all of my cells. And then that third picture is what all of those cells look like right after uh, or right before they were going to be put back inside me after the week long of chemo when I became neutropenic right before starting um, the, the IL-2 process. So like I said before, in terms of kind of first, then interleukin-2, um, in terms of some of the side effects, chemotherapy, fatigue, loss of appetite, hair loss, um, and as a competitive swimmer, you know, going from having hair to not having hair wasn't that big of a deal. It was just all the rest of everything that kind of was the shocking part of it. For interleukin-2, and um, we'll get into that on the following slides, it was definitely an experience I will not forget. Um, I like to compare that to a movie. It's called The Fighter. So there's a scene in the movie where um, Dickie El Elmer, who's being played by Christian Bale, is being weaned off of cocaine, and he's actually in a jail cell. And he cannot control himself, and his body is freaking out, and it's convulsing. And when I was going through the aisle, too, that's actually what I kept on thinking about. I had watched the movie recently to getting onto aisle two and it you weren't able to like control so i had a hickman catheter and the advantage of that was being able to have the nurses come in give me medicine which then calmed my body down but the il2 was a dose every eight hours so three times a day so i made it through um basically two days and i was about to go on to the next dose and my doctors came in and they were monitoring everything and my oxygen levels had depreciated and they were like, well, that's, that's all we can do. 
in my head, I was like, no, I can do one more. My doctor's like, no, you definitely can't do one more. Um, and I guess that was kind of that mentality of that movie, The Fighter, thinking that I was actually part of that. Um, but that was an experience for, for IL-2. So in terms of the second clinical trial that I was on, this was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which was the first time that they did the combination drug of ipilimumab and nivolumab. This was all outpatient therapy and it was a total of 12 months. Um, overall, this clinical trial compared to the first one was a breeze for me personally. Um, I didn't have to redo chemo, the side effects of them all. I only had one overarching uh, time where I had to get additional treatment, which was essentially just giving me a steroid. I had some rashes, um, which put me into the ER, but overall it was actually um, much easier to, to deal with as an outpatient than actually going through the first trial. Um, and some of the outpatient therapies, and you heard me say this in the video, as people to kind of be post to social media, I was going to playing beach volleyball games in New York City after um, going through an actual treatment because I wanted to keep that self of, of, of normalcy. So I wanted to continue to live my life and I didn't want this to slow me down. Um, and if you're looking at the picture and you're thinking, is that an umbrella in what looks like contrast? You're right. Um, every time I would go in Sloan, they would ask you whether you wanted your contrast to be room temperature or if you wanted it to be refrigerated. And I always said refrigerated with an umbrella, please. And I guess I said it one too many times. So after one of the times going in, I asked for it and I asked for my umbrella and the nurses behind the counter gave me an umbrella. That's amazing. I, you know, I know, Brendan, I'll never look at those small umbrellas the same way again, that's for sure. And a great reminder of, uh, of your amazing journey that you're sharing with us. So would you mind telling us a little bit more about some of the key things that you learned through this this whole process? Sure. Um, so I've detailed out a bunch of kind of the learnings and takeaways. And I think for everyone that goes through treatments, you are learning things differently and your takeaways are very different. It's very um, individualistic. For me personally, um, the first thing I realized was that cancer is, is not a choice you don't choose to get cancer. It's not like you're going in to buy a car and you're getting the choice of, you know, do you want to buy a Toyota Camry or do you want to buy a Maserati? I mean, you don't get the choice, but kind of, you know, it's chosen to you. So you you have to just play the hand that you're dealt, which leads me to the second, which is kind of control what you can and don't worry about what you can't. Um, you can control getting, you know, cancer and getting how bad it is, but what you can control is super important. Um, and I learned to not actually worry about things that I couldn't worry about. And, you know, things today when people complain about the weather, it drives me crazy. It's one of those things where you just know you've no control over it. Um, so to, to kind of put everything into context, just kind of control what you can. Um, always bring a positive attitude because that's something that you can control. So when you're going into treatments or you're going in for scans or for checkups, I feel like the, you know, that that positive power that you have within yourself is something that's super important. And if you think positive, then positive things will happen. And creating something to look forward to. I know we've kind of talked about the 30 things in 30, but for me, it was important to have something to look forward to. And it doesn't have to be something that's, that's grand or overarching, but even something small, just to kind of keep your mind off of what is currently going on, um, definitely helps a lot. Support systems. You know, whether it's a parent, whether it's a grandparent, a friend, um, a cousin, um, or even just, you know, there's a slew of different other op um, opportunities for people to then become a support system, whether it's through um, grants or processes within the hospital themselves. You know, having someone to talk to or someone that's been through that process that you can just kind of bounce ideas off of, of what things you may be going through with someone that gets it is super important, which is one of the reasons why I tend to do these types of webinars and you know reach out to individual people because I want people to know that there are other people that have gone through it. Um, and I always said to myself, it can always be worse. And I know that's a weird thing to say for someone that was, you know, my dermatologist says that I should be dead and, um, but it's true. Um, when I was down at NIH, there was people that I met on the floor that are no longer with us because theirs was worse than mine. 
um, whether it was, you know, any different forms of cancer. So to always put that in perspective is something that I continually reminded myself and that kind of went back to how cancer wasn't a choice and having a positive attitude. Um, your doctors, nurses, and scientists, I don't know everything there is to know about melanoma and I don't know everything there is to know about cancer in general. I know enough, but definitely not people that had spent their entire lives dedicating themselves to to the science of it. So you have to go through this process, especially when you're you're signing these forms and it says your side effects could be anything from, you know, aches, pains, nausea, diarrhea, or death. You have to trust that your doctors and your nurses have your, your best self um, in mind and that they are doing what they have been taught and trained and, you know, that's what they are there to do. Clinical trials, um, I probably, I definitely wouldn't be here without them. So they, they, they save lives and they're super important to make sure that the next person that is going through it has a better chance of, of surviving. Um, and that leads into, you know, medical advancements are happening and they're happening because people are brave because they're going through clinical trials um, and they're happening all the time. And even if they're small little pieces or little things that happen from time to time, it ends up growing into something much, much bigger. So this is uh, my current doctor at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I had asked him if he had a quote that he would like to, um, to have within this presentation um, webinar, and I'll read the quote. Uh, he said, the improvements in the treatment of advanced melanoma continue to be an exciting and wild ride. I hope it will continue, and once everything has had a great outcome, then I will be able to retire early quite happily. Um, it's been um, a great opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Passau and you know, I, part of my personality was obviously keeping everything, you know, real, so to speak. So I usually don't call him Dr. Pasta. I usually just call him uh, um, DMP, Dr. Mike, or Dr. Mike Pasta. Um, and him and I have done some webinars together as well. And having a relationship with your doctor where, you know, you, you need anything or just have questions or if you're doing something like this, you know, you're able to kind of give him a call or text an email and you know he's right there to kind of help along the way. That's great. Really appreciate the reflections and, and especially the, the learnings and, and takeaways that you shared with us. Uh, really applicable to all of us, I think, in, in, in so many ways. So thanks for that. You know, you touched again as you did in the video on on 30 things at 30. Um, please tell us just a little bit more about that and just what it meant for you. Sure. Um, so while I was sitting at NIH and NCI one night in between treatments, I started to make a list, a list of things that I wanted to do, things I just you know wanted to have, things that I thought I would never be able to get. And the list grew and grew and grew. And I kept adding to it. Um, so I started treatments when I was 27. And when I was turning 28, which happened to be my golden birthday, I'm born on February 28th, so 28, 28. So I didn't realize it was a thing until um, I was going through all this and someone had reminded me, oh, that's your golden birthday. That's like a big deal. Um, so I decided that after treatment, I was going to do something that was a big deal. So um, I always wanted a Jeep Wrangler. So on my 20th birthday, I walked into a dealership. I said, who wants to sell me a Wrangler? I'm walking out with one today. And I walked out with the Wrangler on my 20th birthday. I drove home to my parents' house and they were like, how did you get here? I didn't own a car before. Um, and it was my dream part and it was one of the things that I always wanted. Um, and then to keep up with that, I always wanted, I always wanted a jet ski. So I ended up buying a jet ski leading into that summer. Now, some of you might be thinking, you're a melanoma survivor, you have a convertible and a jet ski, probably not the most ideal thing for a melanoma patient, but I promise I have a huge bottle of sunscreen with me at all times, anytime that I, um, use the convertible part or I go out on, um, the jet ski. Um, so that was the first two things. And then I still had this enormous list of things that I had created and I was trying to figure out the best way to kind of do some of the things. So I decided when I turned 30, why not create 30 things to do in 30? So 30 things I could do before turning 31. Um, and my girlfriend now wife at the time, instrumental in making sure that I stuck to this list and made sure that I was able to get it done. Um, you can see the list a uh, little on the left, but some of the things I'll just highlight um, went skydiving. 
I recommend it. People might think you're crazy for doing it. You should totally do it. It's an amazing experience. Um, hiking to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and then camping at the bottom of the Grand Canyon was, was amazing. Um, I always wanted to, for whatever reason, stand in four states at one time. So New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado, the four corners, um, did that. We went whitewater rafting, uh, learned to rock climb, went rock climbing in Garden of the Gods, uh, which was amazing. Uh, run a half marathon. I don't think I'll ever do a full marathon. I think the half marathon was enough for me. <laughs> uh, to drive the Pacific Coast Highway in, in, a, in a convertible. I recommend anyone, if you're going to do it, definitely drive south so that you're actually on the water side as opposed to driving north. Um, we went dog sledding. I learned to snowboard. I was a skier growing up um, and figured, you know, why not try something as well? So learned how to snowboard and then also um, ice climbing. Uh, if you've never gone ice climbing, it's very interesting um, knowing that each time that you're moving up that individual ice, you have to make a new you know, mark in order to move up it. Um, so it was pretty cool. It sounds absolutely awesome. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if skydiving is for everybody, but the, there's definitely some, something on that list for everyone, right? That's for sure. You know, one of the things that really sticks with me is how your treatments ran parallel to the transition from conventional treatments to two immunotherapies for melanoma. And during this time, we saw how the introduction of this new class of immunotherapies, specifically the checkpoint inhibitors, ipilimumab and nivolumab, helped to transform melanoma treatment, resulting in higher efficacy and better outcomes for patients. And the success of these treatments led to additional studies and approval of further indications that these treatments could support. So as we move to the next slide, we see that the impact on patient outcomes has been very significant. Death rates from melanoma had been on the rise since the early to mid 1980s. And after the introduction of these new therapies, the death rate had one of the most dramatic declines seen for any cancer over such a short period of time. In our industry, we're all focused on bringing better treatments to market more quickly and making them more accessible to more people. Brendan's story really brings our need for speed into sharp focus. And for me, another situation that highlighted how important timing can be is something that we're all still experiencing at the moment, and that's the COVID-19 crisis and, and the pandemic. Our industry has always focused on developing life-saving therapies and vaccines, but the pandemic created an urgency in our industry that really allowed us to move more quickly and collaborate more openly than ever before. We know how important timing is for patients and their families, and so I challenge us all to think about what we've learned from the pandemic, which in many ways has been the finest hour of biotech and pharma. What have we learned and how can we apply it every day to support the development of new therapies going forward? So, so Brendan, you know, with the pandemic, what, what have you learned through the course of the pandemic uh, for you specifically? I was lucky enough that I was, I was done treatments by the time the pandemic started. So I was super thankful for that, but I could not think about those that had to postpone or delay treatment or even cancel treatments because of the pandemic. Um, and I've heard that cancer screenings due to the pandemic have plummeted and, you know, doctors are worried that this next year to two year gap on the screenings will have a severe impact in years to come. Um, I also learned that the work that the scientists and researchers and doctors do on a daily basis is incredibly important. I mean, sure, it may, you know, it took the pandemic to really shine the light on the importance of mRNA, which I didn't know until the pandemic of how important that really is in creating the COVID-19 vaccine. But to think that that daily grind of those individuals working on mRNA, on something that seemed important, but not like the most important thing of our lifetime is just, is, is wild to me. Um, I was also reminded of how lucky I was you know, I was getting emails from doctors and hospitals that I had treatment at allowing, you know, people to sign up to then skip the line if you were immunocompromised, if you've had previous illnesses, so that you could get the vaccine sooner. Um, but since I was 100% work from home, I wasn't on trials, I had no side effects, I didn't feel it was appropriate for me to kind of take one of those 
positions from someone. So I was lucky enough based on everything that I had gone through to decline the opportunity to jump the line or be the next in the line and really hope that by doing that, someone else that was, you know, situated behind me was able to get that spot. And hopefully that made them stay healthy and potentially even, you know, go on with their additional screenings uh, for whatever they were going through. So once again, thank you for having me today. But just the, the last part that I would just say is just a huge thank you um, to the doctors that I have come across within my life. Um, and it's not just a thank you to them, it's a thank you for today for me, and it's more importantly a thank you for tomorrow. Um, and the quote that I have here on the screen, um, it reads, you don't realize what you have until it's gone. By the time you realize what you had, it's too late. Live every day to the fullest, be yourself and love yourself for it. Um, it's kind of a mantra that I've always, always had, and I think it rings true even more uh, today and more um, every, day, every single day. Right. Well, thank you very much, Brendan, for sharing your story with us today. We, we really appreciate your time and taking us through your brave and successful journey, and we certainly wish you all the very best for the future. Uh, I'd like to also thank the audience for joining us today. Uh, this pres presentation actually concludes our agenda for the day, but please don't leave the event just yet. Uh, I invite you to visit the virtual exhibit booth the Upstream and Downstream Process Development Labs, and also our Scientific Poster Hall. You'll find lots of solutions and technical expertise there that will surely help your biomanufacturing process. So thanks again, Brendan, and thank you, everybody. Thank you.